For decades, residents in the South Patrick Shores area believed cases of cancer and ALS were linked to the dumping of military waste after World War II. Florida Today environmental reporter Jim Weimer has been covering the story, which attracted water activist Aaron Brockovich to Brevard County. In August, the Department of Defense finally admitted that military waste might be buried there. That admission opens the door to a possible future cleanup. Welcome to Florida Today's I am Brevard. I'm Isadora Ringel. Today, you will learn what prompted the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to visit the Space Coast recently. I'm sitting down with Jim Weimer to talk about what's next for the people who bought homes built on top of the military waste. Jim will also discuss a recent study that alleges U.S. standards for drinking water are not strict enough. Jim, welcome back on the show. Good to be here. So you've been working on a lot of things, but I think your major story in the last couple of weeks has been how the Army Corps has finally recognized that the area in South Patrick Shores was a military, was a, a dumping ground for military waste. That is a major breakthrough, you know, regarding everything that you've been working on in the last year or so. Explain what is going on. Why is this former military dumping site a big issue here in Brevard? Well, yeah, it really is a watershed moment. Uh, there have been grassroots efforts for over 30 years to really get the military to acknowledge what they did back around the World War II era, era where they were, um, basically when the base was built, they were um, just about a half mile south of, of where the base is being built. They were kind of dumping everything under the sun without uh, the private property owner's permission. There, there was some verbal understanding of, you know, we, we were a nation at war and everybody wanted to help out. So this property, yeah. there was a verbal agreement that, yeah, you can, anything that can be burned and just they were thinking it was wood crates, things like that, well, ended up after the war being sort of everything under the sun on the base, including like parts of engines, parts of airplanes. And so there was sort of, um, at the time this was looked at in the 90s, nobody could find a smoking gun document that proved that there was some agreement, some lease or, or other kind of agreement that made the military really own this. Well, when uh, people started making this an issue again last year, uh, the military took another look at it. The Ar Army Corps of Engineers had since uh, developed this really um, expertise uh, team out of St. Louis that um, was able to really forensically dig into the archives and find the key documents, the memos between this property owner, his real estate agent, and the, and the military, uh, that they were in fact using this off-site, off-base site for uh, dumping a lot of, you know, basically everything. Yeah. And it's interesting, so this was a Navy base, not Patrick Air Force base, right? So people don't get confused. Yeah, it was it's a Banana River Naval Air Station at the time, and in about 1950 it was, it was uh, uh, renamed Patrick Air Force Base. And so. it was all natural lands at the time, right? And then fast forward decades later, people come and they build their homes on top of this dumping ground necessarily. And so what is now that the Army Corps has finally recognized this, they visited... Um, a few homes a couple of weeks ago to look at what was in someone's backyard. We met Sandra Sullivan. She lives in Satellite Beach, in the Satellite Beach area, and we saw her backyard and all this debris, including even like all the glass Coke bottles from like the 1940s. And what have they found and what are they going to do with all of that? What is the Army Corps going to do now? Well, they're going through like a nine-month process where they're going to take information from residents, people that are concerned, and they do sort of their methodology. They keep delving into the records, what's known, what, what have, what's been inventoried so far, what, what sort of legwork has already been done, what was done back in the 90s. Uh, and, and then what, you know, after that process, they'll uh, go to their superiors and say, well, we think we need to do a project, or no, we think, you know, there's, there's not enough there there. But it's looking more and more like there would be a, a, a pretty large-scale long-term cleanup project from, from just what's known so far. Yeah, so it's interesting. When these people bought these homes, they had no idea that where their homes were built on, right? Or maybe there was some suspicion, but nothing confirmed. Will these people get some sort of reimbursement maybe for, you know, having bought these homes where, and I, I think Sandra Sullivan, the lady we visited, said that she feels she cannot even sell her house because um, there is suspicion that these chemicals in these, all this debris is linked to, cancer, to cases of cancer and Lou Gehrig's disease. So what are, what are these people going to get? What are, what are the possibilities? I think it's, it's not really clear to me at this point what, what would be, you know, beyond a cleanup, 
who, who would really own the liability here, yeah. um, given that this wasn't this was off base, this was on private property. On the legality aspect of it, I think that's something maybe needs to be hashed out. One of the things they're doing is is on the uh, next on, on Thursday, the October twenty fourth, from eight a.m. to uh, eight p.m. They're going to be at Satellite Beach Pel Pelican Beach Park at the clubhouse. There, the Army Corps of Engineers is going to take residents' concerns and come to them with whatever you know information that you have and sort of an information gathering opportunity and, and so where questions like that could be sort of hashed out a little bit. And no one has said that there is for sure a, can, a cancer cluster in that area and uh, there's been movement and people uh, believe that they got cancer because of all these chemicals. I think to you what is your opinion on this? Do you think they're closer to maybe determining that there is a cancer cluster in the Satellite Beach area or I mean how is that even determined? Well, you had six Hodgkin's cases uh, and uh, you had some ALS cases as well that were right on, on these canals right down the road from the base. So it begged the question in the late 80s, early 90s. There was sort of a, a, statistic, a small statistical significance there, but was that yeah. something that could just be a normal variation from year to year? It's not clear that... And folks are really frustrated in thinking that the state really hasn't taken a close, in-depth look at this. That they, uh, you know, they had asked again last year, can you look at the cancer cases? So they looked at nine specific cancers that were associated with the firefighting foams that were used on the base. You know, this, they stopped a few years ago, these controversial, these perfluorinated compounds mm -hmm. that everybody's worried about. Well, they didn't find anything that really jumped out as a huge, significant uh, cluster. But, but the frustration was from this grassroots effort that gathered several hundred cases that weren't even considered as part of this analysis that, that all the residents had, had compiled. Wow. So they're saying, why didn't you look at the whole shebang here to really do a thorough analysis? What, what was the state's response to that? It's sort of all up in the air now. There, there is some rumblings that, that maybe the CDC would get involved and, and take a, a look beyond what the state looked at, but that's still sort of all up in the air right now. Well, if you were ever determined to be the, a cancer cluster or a cluster of ALS cases, I mean, what would happen or instead, besides just getting that name? Is, does anything happen? Do these people get any help? Well, it, it usually speeds up the cleanup. I okay. think there's a political influence factor there that once once you're sort of on, on that map, I mean, it's very rare that you do get clusters. Most of them have been occupational exposure type things like yeah. asbestos and things like that. But um, I, I think it's the, the uh, congressional attention that you would get having that, you know, a, a formal CDC declaration of a cluster. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because these people have for so long been, you know, uh, talking about this and raising awareness of it. And I think more and more people are starting to take these people seriously, right? Because when you hear, oh, this is a cancer cluster, it sounds a little bit like a conspiracy theory, I think, to a lot sure. of people. It seems like these people are starting to get more and more credibility as this case moves forward, and as you get the Army Corps to finally recognize this, right? Well, yeah, and I think you get... You get to a point where you get so much anecdotal evidence when people are, are digging up parts of airplane wings in their yeah. yards, that, which has hap happened in the, you know, decades ago, and all these things sort of build up into a narrative, and, and then you see what ha what's happened elsewhere on and near military bases that it starts begging these questions to where the, the, the public health officials start, you know, have to really take it seriously. It's scary. Um, and another scary thing that you've been working on is a, a study by an environmental group out of Washington, D.C. that says the federal waste, uh, federal drinking water standards are not strict enough. And they actually, Brevard is among, I think, the 50,000 uh, utilities that have higher levels of contaminants. Can you explain what the, that study has found? Yeah, it's Environmental Working Group. They're a nonprofit based out of Washington, D.C., and, and they've been uh, sort of a little bit controversial among professional toxicologists for years, saying some of these, you know, they, what they're doing is, is they're hiring their own staff scientists who are looking at a lot of the, the, the newer research out there and conducting their own studies, 
and finding that, that this cumulative effect of, of all these different contaminants working in concert, what is the risk of that? What's the compounded risk? And what they're finding is that a lot of the levels for things like disinfection byproducts, that when you add chlorine to uh, drinking water, like when you're using a lot of surface water, like we do in Brevard, Lake Washington, and there's a lot of organic matter in it, when you uh, disinfect it, you get these byproducts that over the course of a lifetime can increase cancer risk. And, and you know, the science is sort of, has been emerging on that. And they're saying it you know, should be orders of mag magnitude, these, these federal standards that have been set. So when they, what they did was take all the utilities, water quality data, put it into a more user-friendly format where you can search by zip code, go and look at your utility, and then you can see a comparison of what they think, what this group thinks the standard wow. you know, base. So are you 300 times the trihalomethane levels that they think it ought to be? Now this is, you know, these standards, you know, and part of what they're doing is trying to really um, criticize the EPA for the last two decades, not really updating a lot of the um, Safe Water Drinking Act standards. And when you when you look at Brevard, your zip code in Brevard County, what are people going to find? You're going to find things like trihalomethanes. It's, it's chloroform and then, you know, three other types of trihalomethanes that are sort of combined and they, they calculate it on a running average every quarter. And if you're over, I think it's 80 parts per billion, then you're in violation of the standard. Mm -hmm. Now you can drink it, it's not an acute risk, but what, you know, what, what you're doing is a trade-off here. You're, you're chlorinating the water so that you don't have to worry about microbes, so that's the acute risk, but you're trading it off for this sort of lifetime increased risk that if you drink this water for 70 years, yeah. a liter a day, there, you might see several more cancers per 100,000 population, that kind of thing. Wow, that is... Um concerning to to think as I drink tap water all the time when you're covering these things are you more concerned about well, the water that you drink well I think it's just being aware of it because because like trialomethanes for instance and, and the haloacetic acids which are related disinfection products by byproducts are similar you know if you have a carbon filter pitcher okay. pitcher filter, like a Brita filter yeah th okay. that, that'll work anything that was a slow percolation with that's carbon activated that'll take care of a lot of it of those compounds and, and if you you know, pour that water into an open pitcher, leave it overnight in your refrigerator, a lot of it's going to aerate out as well. It'll okay. sort of outgas. So, so you're taking care of most of it. But, you know, what they're concerned about, this group, is that the folks that don't know, and, you know, you're absorbing it in, when you're washing your hands, when you're breathing the water, when you're taking a bath or a shower. There's other, you know, routes of exposure as well. Yeah, and there was a one, the, reading your article, that it's not just drinking. Can you talk about so showering and washing your hands can be actually worse? Yeah, because you're absorbing it through your skin. So, so um, yeah, some studies have found that people's exposure just from, from showering can be more than they're getting from the drinking water. It can be in, these compounds can be in food as well. It can be in coffee, which, you know, the, 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 where these, uh, you know, this water is reacting with the organics in the coffee. Okay. Being, you know, so, so there's a lot of, it's just being aware of it and, you know, your overall exposure over time and the utility that you're, you're uh, the customer of just be aware of what's in, in the water and how wow. you can deal with it. And what is the name of the group and why is it, it controversial? It's the Environmental Working Group, okay. so they've been dubbed by some professional toxicologists and pro-industry groups as, as the Environmental Worry Group. Okay. That to get to fundraise that they are, you know, trying to put the fear of God in people of all these different compounds that are really, uh, you know, in these trace amounts, some of the stuff we're talking parts per trillion uh, that, that is maybe not uh, as solid uh, relative risk science there that, that they're claiming, that they're overstating the risks of what's known. But, you know, anytime there are unknowns in a lot of this stuff, that, then people kind of fear the worst. Yeah, so, I know. Yeah. And that's, I think for you as a reporter, it makes that your job even more challenging because how do you know which data to trust, right? Sure, and I think it's just being aware that, that, you know, all these groups do have their various agendas and you decide for yourself what risks you're willing to live with. Absolutely. And speaking of drinking water, um, um, the Melbourne utility has been facing a lot of criticism from residents. It all started a couple of months ago when the taste of the water changed. It became kind of earthy and uh, people were not happy with it. And then it, we had a huge town hall meeting organized by State Representative Randy Fine the the city says the water is safe to drink but there's been algae blooms blooms found in lake washington where the water comes from and some people are still concerned that that algae bloom the the, the algae could be impacting the drinking water 
can you let's let's clear the record and make sure what does the city say? What do we know so f at this point? You know what is causing uh, this weird taste and smell, and what are the facts in this case? Well, the, the strange odor started in, in July when they, they were finding cyanobacteria blooms. That, that's a blue-green algae in Lake Washington, which is their main source of supply. And so what, what, what they mostly were finding is an issue with the, uh, sort of pre, the raw water. And that they found saxitoxin, which is one of these cyanobacteria uh, toxins that they produce. But it was never ending up in the sampling that they were in, in the finished water. But the, the strange odor was there. So that was sort of a bio, like a, a semi-volatile organic that is, is, a, is sort of given off when these algae die. Now, it's not anything that can hurt you, but it's the aesthetics of the yeah. water. that yeah. I drink it because right, I go to my right. gym and the, the smell was really strong. Yeah, geosmin, I think, is, is the compound that, that was involved there. And in very, very trace amounts, the human nose can sense it. No. But it's more of a taste and odor thing. It's not really something that's that's a long-term or short-term health risk. But their city saying that you know we had an unusual year. We had it, it got a lot hard, hotter a lot earlier this year, and so you're seeing a lot of evaporation in the lake. So that that sort of concentrated the algae, and you're seeing flow problems in the system for for that reason. And for you know there, there's fewer people around pulling drinking water in non-tourist yeah. times. So okay. they weren't getting the, the usual flow rates that they get. And there's also disruption from some construction projects going on. And then they had sort of a perfect storm of, of the treatment processes at their plant that usually deal with these sort of supply, supply issues were, were in the process of being fixed. And, and so they got kind of caught a little bit with that. Yeah, so the city says the water is safe to drink based on Federal state standards, I assume, but then you have a group like this nonprofit saying that the standards are not good enough. I mean, do I think it's understandable why people feel a little maybe I'm going to say paranoid, but maybe not paranoid that they feel concerned that really, how, who do we trust in terms of the quality of our drinking water? Well, to their credit, uh, the city of Melbourne very proactively goes out every summer anticipating these cyanobacteria blooms and they test the raw water and if they see a problem there they make changes at the plant to to deal with it the, these aren't even right these compounds and there's a litany of them from these blue green algae species there's no epa regulations or standards on yeah. there, there might be some vague guidelines to go by but, but the, not a ton is known about their health the long-term health risks from them. But, you know, this has been an issue in, in South Florida as well with the microcystin blooms and whoever's pulling surface waters as, as part of their supply has to deal with that. So we've had that in, in Lake Sawgrass here and, and it's been in Lake Washington in the past or, or you know, species that will produce that toxin. So uh, this, this is sort of um, a, a, a learning process that, that you know, they, the thing is the city also has ozone treatment, which takes care of a lot of these types of toxins. So they'll, they'll do, make changes that, you know, at the plant that they can really deal with the stuff. They're aware of it. And folks who get water from cocoa, which is my case, so maybe but what is the status there? Is there anything to be concerned at this point? Well, they did not. They pull about 30% of their supply from Taylor Creek, Creek which is a, a reservoir that was sort of an, an outcropping of the St. Johns River that okay. was created decades ago. Um, and when I asked them, they said that they had no visual signs of any algae bloom, that this was not blooming in that part of the St. John's River for whatever reason. So it was, that wasn't an issue. You know, and about two, you know, the other 70% of their water is coming from the aquifer, groundwater. So the, you know, they have had issues with disinfection byproducts, like a lot of utilities in Florida. And, and so that, um, that's been their main issue, but that again, that's more of a much like a lifetime risk rather than something that then, you know, is going to harm yeah, in and, the short term. And the algae blooms in Lake Washington, where Melbourne gets its water, uh, I think that most people will agree that it's probably caused by biosolids, which is the treated sewage sludge that's brought from utilities in South Florida and spread on agricultural um, lands up around the St. John's River, right? Um, the county just uh, imposed a moratorium on new spreading of biosolids, but people who are already using biosolids are, can continue to do it. Do you think that this moratorium is going to be effective? Or are there people trying to spread biosolid here in the future? 
I think that that was sort of to stop the bleeding, so to speak, that, that there were some phosphorus rules of, of, that were tightened in South Florida that made it almost impossible to land apply biosolids sludge from the sewer plant on, onto a lot of these agricultural lands. So as a result of that, the unintended consequence is that all those biosolids from like Miami-Dade and, and other South Florida counties started pushing up. In because our, they in banned it right. before we did. Right. Essentially, well, they made it impossible because the limits were so hard to reach. So now we started getting a lot, or, or, or the concern is, well, these ones that are already permitted, if, if that continues to happen, are we going to see more and more until everybody's waiting for the State uh, Department of Environmental Protection you know, they had a task force that looked at all this that was going to come up with stricter standards for the, in, the entire state. So after this technical advisory committee went through all the science and, and best management practices, everybody's in a holding pattern to when those r new rules kick in. So this was Brevard's way of saying, well, until that happens, until. let's stop the bleeding. And once the rules kick in, even the, the bans in South Florida, they will be eliminate it, right? That the rules will supersede whatever local regulations exist. That's my understanding, yeah, that those were, and that those were going to have stricter, things like stricter setbacks and, and, and ways of really uh, dealing with the issues that they're concerned about. Now, there's also a lot of septic tanks around Lake Washington, so that's thought to be a contributing okay. factor as well. So, um, you know, that's another issue to be dealt with. Yeah, and you wrote a story recently about how pollution in the St. John's River is increasing because of sewage uh, sludge. So it's not just a Lake Washington issue. It's like, it seems like St. John's has been disproportionately impacted by, by all of this, right? Well, yeah, they, they, the St. John's River Water Management District took a look at Blue Cypress Lake, and they found a pretty strong correlation between the increase in phosphorus in the lake and the application of biosolids. So that was where others started extrapolating from that well, you know, begs the question, yeah. Lake Washington as well, and all these other parts of the river that are surrounded by these huge uh, tracts of agricultural land that are permitted to accept this, this kind of stuff from the sewer plant. So. And there's also two types of biosolids. One of them is not even regulated, which is the Class A, and some scientists believe that, that there's an issue with that as well. Um, but one of the, I, wrote a column about this not too long ago and one of the things what that I heard from a scientist is that you know Florida should change the way it looks at biosolids instead of changing the regulations we should look into reusing that sludge instead of dumping it on farmland and actually you know reuse it or recycle it and there is there technology right now that we're looking at to make that happen instead of having to deal with these issues? Yeah, there's waste to energy plants that can extract things like ammonia and, and things that can have some market value to them. Uh, it's, it's your capital, your startup costs, it's not a cheap thing to do. Yeah. So there's an effort, I think, even from Brevard County asking the legis state legislature for some, some uh, sort of seed money to get a pilot program going and show the rest of the state that this can be done and this can be an environmentally friendly sort of win-win for everybody. Yeah. It seems that Florida's problem is a poop problem for the most part. It's like you have septic tanks, then you have sewage, and then you say let's all convert to sewage, but then you have the biosolids issue. I mean, it seems like such a complex issue to solve. Well, you know, from the Space Coast here, we made it to the moon, but we can't seem to handle <laughs> our waste streams yet. So I, I think it comes down to, like most things, a money issue and, and, a, and a, a political will. But uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in the modern era, you think we'd come up with, uh, you know, better things to do than to just kind of dump it in our own backyard. Yeah, it's crazy. And another story that you worked on that isn't related to this is, um, is about Judah and Sons. They were a family-owned fishery in Sebastian that recently closed. And they were, I believe, the last um, old Florida fish market, I believe, or one of the last ones. Well, yeah, they, well, as far as I could tell, they were one of the last really um, commercial fishing families uh, that were the original owners of, of, of a fish market like this, a retail fish market. And they, they held on and held on, and you know that, there was a gill net ban, a ban on these nets that entangle fish by the gills that used to take in these huge nets into the, into the estuary and drag them over the seagrass and, and sort of corral in the mullet and, and bring, him, bring him in in mass. But uh, there was a huge political campaign in the early 90s, and by 95, 
uh, voters had voted to do away with these nets. And so now you could only go out with a cast net and they couldn't make a living doing this. And so, uh, you know, they were, they were um, one of the last markets that really served a low income uh, you know, customers that were, were, you know, you don't have to go to Walmart to get, yeah. uh, it, and so they were selling for a real fair price, but it was just, um, it was more their father's dream, but they kind of kept his dream going, and, uh, you know, all they sort of knew was fishing, so, uh, you know, Bobby Judith, who, you know, he, he was, um, uh, you know, his great joy in life was to clean fish for people and just see, you know, the reaction where they know yeah. that they're getting the best, freshest fish that they can find anywhere. And so he was sort of just devastated. He's dealing with health issues and he doesn't know what he's going to do with the rest of his life. And, uh, you know, he'll get his share. They're selling the property uh, to the neighbor who is probably going to, you know, knock it down and either develop it into another one of these sort of, if you've ever yeah. driven along there, it's pretty nice waterfront homes. But, you know, it was one of the last uh, old Florida fishing villages, uh, you know, the last sort of holdout establishments of that down there. I know, and I read your story, and it was so nicely done, but it was heartbreaking to, to read it and really see this family and their entire legacy is now gone. But I also yeah. wonder with, you know, competition from Publix, you can just go and get some tilapia from chili or right, wherever right. uh i wonder if that's also you know i never go to a family-owned fishery well and part of your point was in was in the whole commercial fishing community in the mid 90s when this whole net ban was going down was that this is there's an environmental justice aspect to this that you're just shifting the resource from one one group to another and it was really the recreational fishermen that had a, a much stronger lobby much deeper pockets they were much more politically yeah. savvy and so the point of a lot of these fishing families now that really suffered from all this is that you don't, for a lot of these species that you were talking about at the time, where's the real solid science that, that proves that this worked? Yeah. You know, here we are all these decades later and this, there's been so much uh, from population growth, so, so much of the water quality has degraded from increasing yeah. runoff that it's hard to tell you know, it's hard to tease out, well, well, you know, how much worse would it have been had we still had these nets? I mean, either way, with the seagrass die-off, are there any, how many, fit, would these guys be able to make a living anyway? Yeah. You know, it almost becomes moot. Jim, yeah. thank you so much, and please continue to do the work that you do, and I'll see you soon again on the show. Thank you. That's I Am Brevard for today. You can re-watch this episode at floridatoday.com. Thank you for watching.